Hello, I'm Anton Ferdinand. I'm in conversation with Metro. Here speaking with David Weir. David Weir, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. I, I feel privileged to be speaking to you, man, if I'm honest. Thank you, mate. I feel the same, you know, talking to a football player. Um, yeah, I feel honoured that you've uh, you know, got the time to, to have a chat about, you know, things going on in the world and, and mental health. Yeah, it's, as, as uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, it's very, very important to me. Uh, the issues around mental health. The big one being for me is that I think it's great that people are speaking about it and people are more open about speaking about mental health, especially as men. Yeah. Um, but I think for us to get to the issue, to the bottom of the issues of mental health and get rid of the stigma of mental health is to, I think we need to start looking at the reasons why we have mental health issues, especially as athletes. Yeah. Um, and that's what I want to speak to you about today. You've win, winning so many medals um, across the board in, in, your, in your sport. Um, and a lot of people, will, people that haven't, don't know about mental health or have never had mental health issues, would, their thing would be, well, why? How can you be, have mental health issues when you've achieved what you've achieved? Um, so my question to you really is, is why have you got? Why have you had mental health issues after after the stuff that you've achieved? Um, my my mental health's been probably with me since I was a child. Um, but I didn't know I had mental health as a, as a as a child uh, problems. Um, for me, I only found out a few years ago after Rio when uh, I didn't perform to the best because of things happened out there with, you know, I got accused of, um, you know, throwing a race and I didn't do my best in a race. And they said that I, you know, messed up the relay. And that really got me down, you know, when a, a, a GB coach telling me that I'm not worthy of wearing a, a, a GB vest anymore. Um, that, that, you know, that was the, the, turning well not the turning point I felt I was having problems before that but you know that 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 spiraled it out of control after that that I couldn't you know I just thought everyone thought I was throwing a race everyone thought that I was no good anymore uh, I thought everyone uh, I thought everyone thought that I shouldn't be in a GB vest anymore and I'm not worthy to wear it and that was just going in my head over and over and over and over and again for all the medals I've won you know, just that one you no know, comment from from someone that uh, shouldn't really comment on me at all. Um, I've won like over 26 medals for my country. I've won, you know, eight London marathons, done 21 in a row. So, you know, it spiraled after that. And I didn't know that until I, I you know, come back from Rio, I was absolutely down. Um, I, I had lots of mental health problems after that. Uh, it's only until I went to a counsellor and um, I, I, I was speaking to them and she said to me, let's go back to your childhood. Let's, um, you know, tell me about your childhood. And I just told the stories that I remember as a kid, I couldn't deal with my disability um, growing up on a council estate being different even though my friends never treated me different but I always felt different you know I couldn't I wanted to play football you know I love football I wanted to ride a bike I couldn't do them things that you know they're the things I love so I remember every day I just used to cry myself to sleep from I really early from six to probably about 16 every night like looking at the sky and, and asking the questions why me why did you pick me why did I have to be like this and um so my, my mental health really started way back when I was younger, but it just spiraled out of control after Rio. And, and like you said, the pressure of, of winning medals, um, it just got on top of me. I, I, I felt like I was pressured um, to deliver all the time. I was pressured to, to be number one in the world all the time and, and putting pressure on myself. I just, I just lost my mind just couldn't cope anymore and, and and that was it i just spiraled out of control you know what's really really interesting is we're what are we a couple of minutes in and the similarities of our obviously the our mental health issues are, are different the reasons why are different 
but there's similarities of, of understanding and having a realization that there's something wrong and very, very similar. Um, you, it, it took something to, to trigger it for you to then go and see a counselor where a counselor took you back to your childhood. Yeah. Um, mine, mine, a lot of my, I don't know if you know, a lot of my mental health issues were based on, on the racial abuse that I received after the incident with John Terry. Yeah. Uh, nearly 10 years ago now. Um, but after doing a documentary and whilst doing a documentary, um, I went to speak to a counsellor. Um, um, she allowed me to understand that I struggled because of the trauma. And But at the time of it actually happening, I felt like I was actually okay. I just wanted to play football. Yeah. Everything else everything else didn't matter. I was fine. I'm playing football. That's all that matters. But the sim similarity that we had to... Mine was 10 years. Yours was a lot longer than, than, than mine. Um, but we had to go back in time to then understand and realize wow we actually had a problem and the problem stems from from a long time ago you know yeah. and uh, uh, it's 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 crazy that when i've sp when i speak to people not just athletes but other people and i and i speak openly about mental health a lot of us have the same type of journey it's just a different trigger yeah which i find i find very very fascinating it was uh, and I didn't see it. So I come back from Rio in 2016, um, devastated of, of what happened with the coach. And my performance wasn't great. You know, it was the first Paralympics I've been to, not medaled since 1996 when I was like a young boy. So, you know, it, it was a different, you know, difficult for me. You know, I was at the top of my game in 2012, unbeaten, win, winning four gold medals. And then I go to Rio and absolutely, you know, didn't perform. And, I just felt like I wasn't looked after by organisations afterwards and it, it was tough for me. And I didn't want to race um, after for a long time. Um, I, I broke up with my, my kid's mum as well at the same time. So I had loads of, loads of things going on in my head. You know, I was confused. I was, you know, um, uh, the, the family home wasn't going well and my racing wasn't going well so my mind just exploded it was just like what 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 am I going to do with myself I wanted to just pack it in and and, and retire but you know I've, I've never missed a London marathon for 21 years so I got myself up up to do it I don't know how I don't know how I got the training I don't know you know some days I just couldn't get out of bed I, I remember getting tablets from um in the doctor, what should I take? And I sat there with a handful of tablets thinking, should I take these antidepressants or not? You know, and it was like, it, well, am I going to be dependent on them? Do I not? I was so confused. And then I got fit for the London Marathon. And I remember doing the marathon halfway through. I started welling up because I knew I was going to win. I don't know why. Something come over me. And I knew I was going to win halfway through the race and I said to myself there and then if I win I'm going to just tell the media that I've had mental health problems I need to tell someone I need to I need to tell the media what I've been through for the last I don't know how long well, it, was, it was six months but it had been longer because it'd been all my life and and that and that's what I did I I, I won um and if I lost, it would have been difficult to, to, to say I've got mental health problems because people would have gone, you're only saying that because you lost. Yeah. So I knew deep down, I knew I had to win and I won that race. And, it, you know, I had no feelings, though. It was like a record-breaking marathon win, no feeling. And I knew there was something wrong, like this should be a, a joint. And that's when I went into the, 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 the media room afterwards I was asking all the questions about the race and, and I wasn't myself. And they said, oh, you're not very happy. And I just said, do you know what? I've been struggling with mental health. And they were all gobsmacked. Like, how have you done this race? And I said, I don't know. I don't know how I've won. I don't know this. And, th and then, do you know what? Since I'd done that, the amount of comments I got from men, you know, not athletes, not just general men on, on, on social media saying, thank you for that it's given me the opportunity now because i've been struggling for years to go and actually see someone and go and speak about it and a lot of disabled people have, have 
you know, I've gone through the same situation as me because being disabled growing up, it, it, it's tough. You know, it's a, a, a daily battle every time, you know, just going out somewhere, you have to make sure there's no stairs, this and that. And it, it's, it's draining. So I had a lot of um, disabled people message me and saying, thank you for speaking out for us. And now I've gone to speak to someone. So I, I feel like I've, and that was the biggest achievement of that day for me, not winning the marathon, but just then people pat me on the back saying, well done for that. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to, to, to speak to you. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, our biggest achievement today. Coming you know out. Just, just hearing that I'm like, I'm wowed because it's like, you've just done something and I can only compare it to myself. That's uh, the marathon will never see me. I can tell you that now, the marathon will never, ever see me. Um, so, and if I did complete the marathon, let alone win it, which will never happen because I'm not an, that type of athlete, but just completing that, that type of uh, race, um, to then put that aside and think about others, you know, and, and come out and tell your truth, which will help others. Yeah. That's where the power is. That's where the where, where the power. And that's why I'm sitting here saying, okay, there's 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 two sides to why I'm so excited to be chatting to you, and I feel can I feel so proud to be speaking to you. Is there's the athlete side of you, but then then there's the person side of you, which is which is like what you've just spoken about. And I, I just think like wow, um, it, it's it's just something that I, I I can't put into. I find it hard to put into words. Like um, that to me, that's strength more than anything. You know, people look at me, I'm strong, I'm this, I'm mentally strong. No, stuff like what you've just said, that's strength to me. You know, being able to, as a man, being able to, to feel vulnerable and show vulnerability, that is strength. And I think there's still a lot of people, a lot of guys who struggle with that, um, yeah. which, plays, which plays a massive, massive part in why they don't know that they're in, in a dark place or why they're having mental health issues because they don't want to let go of the, the bravado of being a macho man. Yeah, I've had, I've had friends, you know, commit suicide you know, when I was younger because, you know, there was nothing out there for them. They were struggling with stuff and, you know, you get the phone call the next day. It's, it's, it's absolutely devastating. One of my friends done it. Um, literally a couple of days after my birthday leading into 2012 and you know it, it was it was devastating for for all of us the the, the community the the estate where I, I grew up on and you know it was it was heart it's heartbreaking because you know he needed help and he just didn't tell anyone you know and uh, and and now like, I see that and, and I've gone through it myself and yeah there's times where I have been in a, a very dark place where you know, I didn't want to be here. And that, and that goes right back to when I was a kid. I used to just say, why am I here? What, what is my purpose on, on this planet? What, you know, what I can't do the things that I really want to do. And, and you know, if I didn't do sport, I probably wouldn't have been here. You know, it, it would have been that bad that I had to find something that gave me a dream or, you know, I could be successful in. And, and wheelchair racing was that. And that's what I got the buzz out of. You know, my brothers were professional boxers. You know, they were at a high level. And, you know, most of my friends were playing Sunday league or, you know, little league when we were kids. And I had no other no other story, you know. I, I love sport and, and I didn't have a story to say, oh, well, I did this in training or I did this. And, and they had all these stories. And, and I think, you know, if I didn't have sport, I would have been in a worse place than I am than, than I am now. Sport has given me absolutely everything, the joys, but it has given me the lows as well with, with pressure and the ex expectation of, it, of being number one in the world or, you know, winning gold medals. And, um, and you know, after that London Marathon, I had to just, just you know, stop for a while because I thought that was... I thought that sport was making me very depressed and it wasn't. I didn't realise that until eight months after. Like I had a complete rest. I've got an academy. I couldn't go down to my academy to see the young athletes. I, I just, I couldn't be around wheelchair racing or wheelchair, you know, disabled people. I, I just couldn't cope with, with anything. I couldn't get out of bed on, and stuff. 
and I thought it was the sport that was getting me down. And it was only till my coach said, right, come back slowly. Let's, let's do a couple of sessions. You've said you're going to do the London Marathon. You need to start training. So I did a few sessions in October. I wasn't ready. I just, I wasn't ready. And I got back in my chair in January and then, and then um, I just started to enjoy the training. That's what, you know, start enjoy the training. Don't put pressure on yourself. And then I won London Marathon again that year. So it was just, and then now I just absolutely love it again. I've just, you know, I can't stop training. I love competing again and uh, I've got the, got the love for it again. But I realised that having that time out done me worse than actually doing the training. I should have just kept training and not done the racing for a bit and just kept fit because as soon as I started training and feeling fit again, my mind started to get better. And that's mm -hmm. when I knew that I have to keep training because when I was sitting at home and I was going to see my mom, I, you know, but I didn't realise that training was, was a, a good tool for your mind. And you hear yeah. so many talk about it, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been retired two years. Um, this whole year and a bit, we've been in, in a basically been in a lockdown. And the thing that's kept me going, other than my my wife and kids, has been doing training. I, I train every morning, uh, yeah. Monday to Friday, um, and that's what's kept me sane, so to speak, in terms of that kept kept get it kept me in a routine. Yeah, and that, I, that I, I routine. We like we like routine as athletes. That's that's a, a given. Going back to the Olympics, what like what were the difference? But what were the difference between each Olympics that you went to? What was the difference in them, which, which you could tell, um, like the difference that from the first one to the second one in terms of your mental health? What was the diff? What was the difference that made them made made you feel the way that you felt? I think in 1996, I was a young, you know, I was 17 years old. I was I just turned 17, so I was the younger one of the youngest GB athletes there. Um, you know, I was buzzing to be at a Paralympics at 17 years old, made a final and, and, and done all right. Didn't, didn't medal, but I, I just got a bit disappointed that after that, the Paralympics will never be on the same level as, as the Olympic guys. And that, that used to really, I, could, I just couldn't deal with that. I, I felt like we was just as good as, or, or, or even better, you know? And, and after that, I just, I come away from the sport and didn't think it was going to uh, be, you know, a, a, as good as the Olympics. So I come away from the sport and then I saw Sydney on TV in, in, in 2000 and, and realised I've done a massive mistake because it was one of the best Paralympics that was held. There was crowds and, you know, it felt like the Olympics and you didn't, you didn't feel any different. And then, um, so I, I come back training and, and went to Athens, but Athens was just as bad as as Lanta. But I won medals there, so I just got the buzz of winning medals, and um, you know. And then obviously going to Beijing was even better. Uh, uh, going there, I was you know world record holder in in a number of distances, and you know I come away with two golds and and a silver and bronze. But you know London was the pinnacle of of, of my career, and. Um, going there do you know what going there my mental health state was 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 pretty good i i didn't deal with i dealt with pressure a lot differently then um i you know a lot of british athletics and team manager were putting four gold medals around my neck and so i had that pressure but i seemed to have, i was really good at deflecting it and just not thinking about that and i i just used to say to myself that every time you turn up for a London marathon, people think you're going to win anyway. So, you know, your attitude is go into London in the best mental and physical shape as possible and try and win one gold medal. And that was it. That was my, my aim was to win one gold medal in London and to come away with four was truly, uh, I was amazed myself, you know, and I didn't look back in, at the videos until probably about two or three months after and just realised what I'd done there and you know I had a flood of tears of 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 joy and excitement for what I done you know record breaking winning four gold medals in 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 my home home country so yeah and I think the pressure changed after that you know you see one comment 
if I didn't do well in a race or you sit on the BBC Sports page and, you know, I, I, I didn't win a race and I've maybe come fourth or fifth and, and it'll be like, is it is that time for Dave to retire? Or is just the little t- tiny comments just really started putting pressure on me, you know? Wow. Because I've done one bad race, you know? Uh, again, like, different, but the same. Um a lot of pressure that I had growing up as a footballer was obviously being in the shadow of, of my, my big brother, Rio, who who arguably was the best in, in, in our position. Um, and similar, like you say, you'd hear, you'd read a comment, someone said, if you hadn't won, won a race and someone said, is it time for you to finish and stuff like that. Mine was, if I never done something that I like and meet a Rio, Within five minutes of someone watching me, I was rubbish. I weren't good enough. I, I think you'd get more pressure because you got more of a bigger profile. See, mine wasn't too bad because I wouldn't have, you know, the amount of social media followers like you and Rio would have. Did you have social media then? Yeah. I no, so. not, not not when I was younger. But as I, oh. as I got older, I'd still I'd still see stuff that would I would hear see people on my my Twitter feed on my Instagram yeah. feed, and I still hear it. To, I still see it today. You're rubbish. Yeah. Rio, Rio's the better thingy, which is the tr- which which I can't sit here and say it isn't the truth because it's the truth in terms of what he done and what what I done in the game. But even though I'm proud of my career and proud of what I achieved, um, coming from a council estate and and proud of being able to come out of Rio's shadow, um, hearing hearing and reading them comments, they still have some type of effect on you. I don't know why, because I'm, you, I should be used to it by now. It's been happening since I was nine years old, so I should be used to it by now, but they yeah. just have that little little thing that they always just get you. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's uh, the comments, I think, it's a bit like when you, you know, you go and get a takeaway and you look at the reviews on the app and you think, you see one comment that does gives it a bad review, you're like, oh, do I really want to, do I really want to eat from there? And I think yeah. it's simply one bad comment and you think it's the end of the world. So, you know, I think you guys must have had, you know, you're in the papers a lot as well and reading the back pages and it, it must have been must have been dreadful. For for us, it it wasn't too bad because, of the, the you know, we're not in the press as much, even though I would like to be in the press as much because I want to, you know, push Paralympic sport as much as I can and, and make it as as good as it can be. Um, but yeah, that I, I think being in the we was in the press. I think for 2012, when I was in the Olympic Village, um, I remember it amazed me that we we had we was in the uh, the village. Sorry, and and GB had this house where we would go in and see the papers every day. And every day in 2012, we was on front, back, and middle, like with all the amazing stories and athletes doing so well and it just blew my mind and I, I just hope that would carry on you know seeing us uh being the papers and and and, and doing well and and being publicized like that in a good way um I just feel like we're 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 forgotten about sometimes and uh I'd like to see us be a bit more in the public eye a little bit um uh, in a good way not now mm-hmm. so um that's the that next stage I think for us Okay. Um, you see, I, I gather that uh, from what we're talking about here and hearing you speak, a lot of the pressure you put on yourself rather than it being from the public in terms of having to win stuff. Do you see it today and, and wish you never put that have pressure on yourself? Sometimes. I, I think, though, that I have to do it to, to get me get me up for, for training and working hard. Um, you know, even now, I think I have to really put pressure on myself now a little bit more because I'm I'm getting older, and and the next group of you know wheelchair racers that are coming through are absolutely awesome at the moment. So one of them that's doing the marathons is twenty year twenty years younger than me, so I'm old enough to be his dad, <laughs> and um, so that that keeps me on my toes. So sometimes I like the pressure because it makes me train a little bit harder. Um, 
now I'm in sort of like a better, better mental state that I can really perform better in training and when I've been racing. So, you know, since I've actually moved away as well, I met my partner and I moved to the coast and that, that helped me out a lot to be out of the area and, um, you know, new training set up. Um, I still come up to London and, and train in Kingston on a Monday and Wednesday and see my academy and my coach. So, you know, I think a lot of things are just really helping me out even more with mental health and being by the coast. I can, you know, when I've had a, if I feel a bit down, I could just go by the sea and it just, I don't know, something by the sea air it just makes you feel, feel better. Uh, mm -hmm. long, along the coast with the missus and yeah I, you know I'm thankful I, I met her two years ago and uh, you know since I, I since I've been with her my, my mount of health's been um, the best it's ever been oh wicked that's that's nice to hear do you do you um, so you can tell me to shut up if it's too personal but do you yeah. do you do you find obviously with your partner now you're more you, you must be more open with her uh, with with in terms of talking about it which allows you to now be in a state of mind where you're better than we than you ever have been yeah i feel like i don't have to hold things in you know if i feel like i've got something to say or i've got a problem you know i can sit there and talk to her about it anything and she's the same as well she can you know talk to me about things but before i used to let things bottle up and bottle up and bottle up and then I'll just explode and and then they'll like well what's wrong with you you haven't you know and 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 people don't know what's going on you haven't said nothing so yeah if I if I feel like I've got to talk about something I I always sit down and, and have conversations about everything about life about what's going on you know with COVID and with with everything you know with 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 life so um and she's been absolutely great she's a she's an art teacher so she's good at good at talking and, and and listening as well so it's it's, it's great good um what did what did it feel like when you realized that you had issues stemming from your childhood about this about your disability what did it feel like when you actually realized that that was a main a major problem do you know what the, the, the first session i had with the counselor I, I couldn't really talk i was in such a like a, a a depressant state that I was stuttering. I I couldn't get my words out. Um, I you know my mind like like really hazy and frazzled. I felt just burnt out. I just couldn't talk and I was stuttering. And I remember just bending over and just literally crying. And 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 you know when I was talking about my childhood, it, it sort of released a lot of anger. And, and and that's what she said. You you're releasing what happened to you when you was a child, you know. Mm -hmm. and did, did you did you did you when you got home that, that that day? Did you instantly go to sleep? Yes, I done the exact I done the exact same thing. The exact same thing I done. The minute I, after that, I went home and I was asleep before my head hit the pillow because I felt yeah. so emotionally exhausted. Exhausted, yeah, and plus because I've been going through a lot of stuff anyway, I was, I, I never used to cry a lot, but I just kept crying for no reason. And it, even when I was seeing my kids every every weekend, I like my eyes would just well up, and I'm, they'll be like, "You're right, Daddy. What's wrong? What's wrong?" And I'm like, "No, I'm fine. I'm fine." And then my eldest girl, she's like, she would have been sixteen, seventeen then. She's like eighteen now, and I had to talk to her about things because she was old enough. And I just said, look, uh, Ronnie, I'm, I'm struggling. I, you know, I can't cope with everything. So she used to obviously come and help me with the kids because I didn't want to not see them because every time I did see them, I felt a little bit better when I saw them, you know? Um, so uh, Ronnie come and, you know, my eldest daughter come and help me and she, you know, helped me out and we went out for days and stuff like that. But as soon as the kids went back, I went into another dive again you know it was a mm -hmm. um, it was a, a tough feeling but yeah after that first session I I slept like a like a baby because I wasn't sleeping at all like I was probably having one hour two hours a night um just constantly thinking about things I, I wonder if you was the same as me um when 
And I sit here, I sit here today and I always I and when I talk about mental health and my own dealings with mental health, I always uh, refer to myself as lucky. I'm lucky. And the reason why I say that, and I wonder if you have the same feelings as me, is um, I feel lucky to be here because when I was dealing with mental health issues and I didn't know I had I didn't know I had them. Um, I didn't realise that they were there until I actually came out of it. When I came out of it, that's when I realised, you know, actually there was something wrong. Well, even after speaking about it, I knew there was a problem, but I didn't realise I actually had mental health issues until I was actually coming out of that that feeling, out of that place. Yeah. My agent before the one I'm with now, I, I rung her and I was, like, breaking down. And I was literally asking her I think I need to go to Priory or something like that because I was just in such a bad state that I didn't know what else to do you know I I didn't know how to control my emotions or feelings or I just I I, I didn't know what else I I needed help and needed to be away but luckily I didn't have to get to that stage um but yeah, there were there were them thoughts where I thought I had to I have to check myself into to to somewhere to uh, really get over this because um, I couldn't do it on my own. Couldn't really do I, it on I, my. Own. I, I never ever really got to that stage where I felt like I needed maybe some type of help, uh, like going to the priory or something. But it was just uh, it was a, a weird weird feeling for me. Like I I felt. I didn't feel like a man when yeah. I was coming out of it. Um, I felt slightly ashamed, you know, um, at, at first. But then I got that realization of, you know what, I'm actually lucky to be, here. especially when you you see people that, that don't ever get out of the mental state that they're in, and they end up harming themselves. They they never get out of it. I'm lucky because I'm able to get out of it and then be able to understand it. And I was. To be honest with you, I was quite ignorant towards mental health when, in my yeah. younger years, when I was playing in the Premier League, I would look at it and be like, "Why? What? Like, what's there to be, be down about?" You know, which was ignorant of me and very like stupid of me. And and, and then, little you know, I was in, I was in it. I became in it. And um, then having the grief of of losing my mother, which then sent it to a a, a different level. Um, where, as you've touched on about losing, you 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 lost the love for your sport and what you yeah. what you were doing. Um, so did I, and I had nowhere to turn. Normally, my uh, normally my sport, normally football was my get out. Anything that I was dealing with, football was always my get out. Training matches, there was always there was always my get out, and I always able to to um refocus myself and feel like I was okay. And then all of a sudden with, with my mum passing away, I, I didn't have that no more. And I started to panic a bit and I just, I never loved the game anymore. And um, to a point where I remember one day that I, um, I went out to go and meet, to go and meet my friends, my friends come to meet me. Um, and uh, I, I forgot about them. I was so intoxicatedly drunk that yep. I, I basically came came out of the the place. I was they was meant to come and get me. I was I was like an hour late or whatever. I was in there and I, I remembered it about an hour later. So I came out of this place and I was almost like walking looking for them. But I was in like a in a in a mad mad zone where I was just walking 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 and I didn't know where I was. I was walking for about 45 minutes and I came back to myself. And when I came back to myself, I was like so far from where I was meant to be. Yeah. So I just had to, I had to get in an Uber and, and just go straight home because I was so, it was like an out of body experience. And Yeah. You're just, because your mind's just somewhere else completely. Yeah. And I, I, you know, you touched on, on, the, on the drinking thing. And, you know, when I had that time out, I, you know, that, that was my, 
you know, when I didn't see my kids on the weekend, I would go to the pub on a Thursday, go and watch a bit of football, maybe on a on a Champions League night as well, have a few beers, and then it'd be another few beers. And you feel great. You think, yeah, yeah. And, and then the next few days, you're just like, you know, it just spiral out. And you don't know yeah. what it is. You, you, you don't think it's the drink or the alcohol or everything. But it's the co- combination of everything, drinking, going out or, you know, um, and, and another thing that got me, I, I, when I was talking to a lot of people, they were giving me so much advice from different angles that I couldn't cope with it. You know, I was like, and they would say, you should do this, you should try this, you should do that, you know, you've got this problem. And then I had to, not like my friends were, were great in helping me, but I just felt like I had to switch off from them and just focus on me. You know, and and that was the start of me starting to feel a bit better as well because I thought, you know what, I don't need that. I, I need to look after myself and, and and focus on me and and my kids. And that's what I did. I started, you know, focusing on me a bit more. That's always a common theme as well. You need to you need to concentrate on yourself. And I I can relate to having too many voices. Um, when there's so many voices, um things become cloudy yeah um and it's the same when when we're looking at sport when we're in sport it's it's, it's very very similar when there's too many voices in in your head in your head from different people when you're going into what you're doing it it can become too cloudy and you start to overthink what it is you're actually meant to be doing what you're yeah. meant to be implementing your game plan you know yeah. it's, it, it becomes a clouded it becomes gray the area becomes gray yeah. Which then takes your focus off, away from what you what it is that you want to achieve. That's exactly what my coach, you know, my coach, I, I've been with her for years. I've known her since I was eight years old. And actually, she was a, a rehabilitation coach and a physio for the Crazy Gang in the 80s so and, and 90s. So she, you know, she was the only woman in football at the time. Uh, so she, she's quite strong and, and you no. Know, her name's Jenny Archer. That she she used to coach a lot of the young athletes, uh, football players as well back in the day, just for extra coaching and stuff. So, um, but she was always, you know, she was she was going in like training. She was my coach. She was my you know go to person if I was like struggling with you know races or struggling with with stuff. She was my mum as well at some points. Do you know what I mean? And I always say to the young lads, you know. When you go to races, yeah, mingle and talk to the other athletes. But, you know, if they start giving you advice, just don't don't take it in. Because, you know, you've got me, you've got Jenny, you know, you've got people around you. They're just trying to put you off and make you worse because they're going to compete against you. So just don't listen. Just concentrate yeah. on yourself and focus on what you've got to do on that day. And they, you know, yeah. they come back and go. Actually, you're right. Someone did just come up to me and say, "Well, if you change that, if you do that, if you..." And what did you do? So I just said, "Oh, thanks for that," and then walked off and got ready for their race. I said, "Because it's, it's just gamemanship. They're trying to put you off and try and, you know, and and try and beat you." So, yeah, it, yeah, it's just as mad things like it's, that. It's it's mad, isn't it? It's like everything's a mental test. Like what you're saying there. Is trying to get into someone mentally to try and change yeah. their thought process. Everything's a mental test, which is why, and especially as athletes, we understand how important the mental side of, of, of our sports are. You know, so imagine you understanding how important the mental side of the game is, but you're having mental health issues. Yeah. It's almost a recipe for disaster in ways that you want to, that you're meant to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I can really relate to that. Um, and, and, you know, going into 2012, my mental state was probably the best it's ever been. And then going into Rio, I didn't know that I had mental problems, but obviously I did because I, I underperformed. And then obviously I got accused of things while I was there. So that just drove it on even more. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely can relate to that. How, how, did that, how did that really make you feel when you were being accused? I'm I'm someone who was an athlete, and to be accused, I was accused once um, for not wanting to play a game. Um, and it, this was in pre-season. I had a slight hamstring injury, and uh, the manager and the assistant manager um, were half accusing me that I didn't want to play. 
Um, and that hurt me deeply that they thought that I wouldn't want to play when if they actually would have get, got to know me a bit better as a person, they were, they were new to, they were quite new to the club. And yeah. if they would have got to have known, spoke to me and spoke to me like as a person and not a player, they would actually have known that that one would never have entered their head to think, well, I wonder if we don't want to play at all. So I, I, I did that really make you feel hearing someone say that? Do you know what? It was, the story is that uh, we had a team, I was going there for my races. So I, I was doing four, 400, 800, 1500 and marathon. And then we had a relay team and we had the European Championships uh, early July, or uh, end of June of 2016. And I went and done the same events there and we won the, re won the relay and we was number one in the world. Like, and I thought, right, this is great. You know, we could win a medal in Rio. You know, and the, the coach there was there at the time, and you know we was we was doing doing really well in the Rio. But when we got to uh, sorry, done well in Grosseto in Italy for the European Championships. Mm -hmm. But obviously everything wasn't going right in Rio. Um, you know, I missed the birth of of my my fourth child, Lenny, so that was on my mind. Um, and then my races didn't go to plan. My my first races. And, you know, I had, when was it? I did the 800, didn't go well, didn't, didn't do well, didn't make the final. And um, my team manager at the time, um, she said, I want you to concentrate on the marathon. And I said, I can't, we can't. I said, because you've brought out a young lad here to do the relay. And he's only doing a relay and you've got no cover for me. So how can we, we can't do it because it's not fair on him. He's a young lad, it's his first Paralympics. And what are you going to say to him? You can't race because Dave doesn't want to do the relay. Because I did want to do the relay because it was a good opportunity for me to win a medal as well. You know, it wasn't going mm -hmm. to plan. So my, that didn't go well, the 800. And then I got up to the track and I'm getting ready for the relay, talking to the team and stuff like that. I don't know why, I just... On my leg, I had no energy. It's like a four by four, so it's only 400 meters. I couldn't get up to speed. I had no energy. I, you know, I just, it just didn't go to plan. And then I come off, went up to the warm up track, and the, the coach come running over to me. You've let us all down. You, you know, you're, you're a disgrace to the country. Uh, you've, you've done that on purpose to annoy me. I was like, why would I? Like, I was obviously swearing. I was like, why would I effing do that? Do you know what I mean? I'm here to win a medal as well. And why would I do that to jeopardize in my makeup? I'm not, I'm here to win. I'm born to win. That's what I, I do this sport for. And she was accusing me. And, you know, it was so embarrassing because the, the, the wheelchair racing family are quite close. So they've known me for years. You know, we race each other a lot over the year. And it was so embarrassing for me, you know, for her to come up and say that to me and I, I just went into this hole I, I just wanted the ground to eat me up and then I, I've tried to get away and then she's chasing me accusing me accusing me accusing me and then I've gone round halfway round to, to my team manager and she said are you okay what's going uh, that that didn't go to plan and I said have you just seen what she's just done to me and she's like what 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 so I told her and she's coming up running over to do it again and and then obviously she's had to tell her to back off and there was other things you know she threw my chair out the the tent that we was in but no one had proof that she did it but the you know and the only person you know who messaged me was working in the media was tanny gray thompson and you know what she said to me the only thing she said to me no no like she just said are you okay do you want me to come and see you? And I was just like, yeah, please. Like, I, I had no one, no one, just no one, just the, the, you know, the, I just felt like I just wanted to run away. I had no one to, to, to help me. And she was the only person that texted me and said, are you okay? Them, them I, words, them words are yeah. so, they're powerful. so important and so powerful. Like, 
just they're so simple as well, aren't they? They're so. Yeah. Are you okay? Are you forget everything? Forget everything forget. else. Are you okay? And it was just like a big no. I'm mm-hmm. not okay. And and you know after that I just I just wanted to go home. To be honest, I just had enough. I you know to be accused of. And then I get one of the other coaches who, who's who helps out that young lad rung me. I've known him for thirty years. And he was one of uh, our wheelchair racing coach, the national coach leading up to Beijing. And I helped him out after, you know, he, he lost his job after that. And I wrote letters in to say, can, can you keep his job? And, you know, he's a great coach, but, you know, I, I helped him and he rung me and said, I'm, I'm disgusted the way you've performed today. I can't believe you let that young lad down. I said, Are you a, a, you've known me for 30 years and is that what you think of me? Is that really what you think of me? You think I've done mm-hmm. that to upset, you know, the other racers or to upset that coach? Not in my mind. I said, you know what? Don't ever, ever talk to me again because I I know what I feel and I know what I've done and, and that's it. Don't ever talk to me again. You know, and yeah. it, I just felt like everyone was against me. Apart from my team manager, she was great. She said, look, just you know, we're, we're sort this out, let's, let's calm down. And because she's the same man, she's got to look after everyone. So, and then I did the marathon and then a Spanish guy sort of crashed into me a little bit. And then I crashed and that was it. My race was over. And I, I just couldn't wait to get on that, on that flight home. But yeah, that, that feeling of, I just felt like the world was against me. I just, mm-hmm. I just, I couldn't wait to get home and just shut the door, but it, it never, you know, that never happened. The door didn't shut and there was an investigation and I don't think the investigation was done properly for me. Um, I was ne- never got help for mental health. It was all left left on my own. I, I just felt like I was just, you know, thanks for everything. See you later, Dave. You know, you've won your medals. Uh, your time's up now. That's the way I felt. I just felt, you know, I've won 26 medals in all. I've won so many marathons. I've put my life to represent my country. And then that, I just felt like, like I was just thrown away like a piece of paper. I think just hearing what you said there, and there's so many similarities to, to, to my incident and, and what happened with me. Um, I, and I touched on this earlier about uh, sport. Um, it's good that people speak about mental health issues and stuff and people more open about it. Um, but to get to the problem of it is to get to the root of why it's happening. That's going to eradicate it quicker than anything. Um, I wonder if, you, like, with me with football, and I think this is why it hasn't been dealt with in football is because yes, they're making noise about um, about people speaking about it, and it's fantastic. But no one wants to get to the bottom of the issue, and the reason why they don't want to be get to the bottom of the issue is because. Um, if they do, then they'll be scared of being held accountable to be playing a part in why it's happening. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that's the same, the same within within your sport, you know, and especially in sport as a whole, I think it is um a sport has a lot to answer to to the reasons why we have this problem. Um, but it is about to get to the bottom of it, people need to be held accountable for why. They're doing it like like the 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 woman Jenny, uh, Jenny Banks. She yeah. should be held accountable for that because that should never happen again to, to anybody, whether it be from from her or anybody else. But will the people in power want to hold her account for that because of of what happened? Well, there was there was an investigation about it, and um, you know, I could have earned money from my story, and I I didn't. I, I said, no, I'm not doing any stories. I, I want the investigation to, to go ahead because I, I feel like I've been treated truly wrong. And the investigation was done in, in-house in pretty much with British Athletics and the investigation come to a conclusion that there wasn't enough evidence that she abused me. When they had letters from the IPC from... Uh, national coaches that they said they were disgusted the way that David was treated at the side of that track. Um, he's not just a, a an ambassador for GB; he's an ambassador for the whole society of wheelchair racing. Yeah. Uh, and then someone obviously 
put a complaint in about my chair going throwing through the the, the tent my my day chair um and it, it was all squashed and and that was it that was that, that that i had no you know well actually this is not what we spoke about you know you you've heard my side of the story i, I just felt like they you know I, i've won so much for the country and they sort of believed her story over mine even though i've been doing what i've been doing for the last 20 plus years you know yeah, yeah. Uh, and it just wasn't a fair outcome. I don't think it was ever a fair outcome. And, you know, I don't like dwelling on the past and it's happened and stuff like that, but I just felt like I wasn't treated in the best way possible. Um, how do you take care of your mental health now? How do you, what, what steps and what do you do now to take care of your mental health? Firstly, I've got a great, great woman next to me. You know, Victoria's been amazing since I've met her. And I was on the on the road of, of, of getting better. And, but since I've been with her and, and, you know, I think just having positive people around me, you know, uh, a, a family, a, a dad comes out on the bike and trains with me. And, yeah, just having positivity around all the time. And, and I, I think because I'm enjoying life again, you know, being disabled, you do have days where, it's frustrating getting in and out of the car and then you forgot something in the house and then you've got to get back out and then get your chair out and then get back, you know, it's just little things like that. But it's not like, you know, I haven't been depressed the way I was for a very long time. And I just think it's because of the people around me that's helped me. Um, I've been just, just amazing, amazing family. And, and, you know, seeing my kids growing up and seeing them as much as I can, it, it's, it's, it's helped massively, I think. That's, that's great. And what what does your what does your academy mean to you? My academy, like, means the world to me now. Like when I was going through my bad times, I felt so bad because I wasn't there all the time. But I just didn't want them to see me the way I was. To be honest, I did go there a few times, but I couldn't get involved. You know, they'd ask me questions, and I'd be a bit aggy. You know, a bit not aggressive, but just tense and and stressed all the time so now i'm i'm down there on a monday and wednesday and i i just love seeing them you know working hard and, and doing well and and it was a dream that i had in 2008 that i was actually quite selfish and i didn't really think about other wheelchair racers or about my sport i was just more focused on me and i remember just having this vision in beijing i was I saw the Chinese and other developing countries in our sport coming in with teams and teams of really world-class athletes. And I looked at our team and we had like, I think seven, six or seven wheelchair racers. And I was thinking, this ain't good enough. Like what's going to happen? What if I just, you know, break my arm and I can never race again? Or, you know, I, you know, I, I just have enough and I don't want to race anymore. And, and I had this vision, like, I've got to do something. I've got to put something back in the sport. And that, and London took took over my life after that, really, because I had to concentrate on that. But I knew it was a good place to start after 2012. And that's why I said to my coach, let's sit up, set up the Weir Archer Academy. And, that, and that's what we did. And we got great numbers coming from pretty much south of England to come and train with us on a Monday and Wednesdays and at the weekends. We got one young boy that's, you know, living up here now and he's originally from Cornwall and yeah we've got a great bunch of, of lads from South London um, some you know from being in gangs and stuff like that as well and you know I've had accidents or been shot or you know one guy had a motorbike crash and uh, yeah so you know we've, it, we've got a mixture of people and I, I just love being around them because we can relate you know we can talk about, you know, if they're having a bad day about their disability, you know, I can talk to them and I know where they're coming from. You know, they could talk to an able-bodied person, but they just, able-bodied people just don't quite understand. It's, it's a hard thing to, but, you know, they can come in and they might be a bit, and I'll talk to them and they'll, they'll be all right. They'll start training and they'll feel great, you know, and, and, and that's what it's about. It's not just about getting the next world-class athlete. This academy was set up just to get people fit and healthy to be honest and, and that's what we've got we've got young kids from eight years old 
up to 30 plus so you know we've got about 26 athletes at the moment which is which is great and it's growing and we're running out of space so <laughs> we're trying to um you know get the funds and uh you know wheelchairs cost it you know you know not cheap to get um so we, we've got some good sponsors that are back in the academy so it's it's, it's great to see oh wicked wicked this i i, I can't I find it crazy. We 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 are two different people, two different walks of life, um, two different sports, but been through stuff that's very very similar. All, yeah. All be all be it, the triggers are different. Mm. Um, the reasons why are different, but the the process, the journey, has been very very similar. Which is is is. I'm sitting. I'm sitting here in awe because it's like wow. Like, and even to do with the academy, it's like I've just launched my own academy for football right. for my community here. And it's is when I'm talking about racism and we talk about gro- grassroots level, people at grassroots level don't have a voice. You know, they don't have a voice. I no. was in the Premier League. I was in the Premier League. I didn't feel like I could have a voice on my own incident. Yep. You know, and and that's what I'm here to try and change. And people will know that within within my academy at grassroots level, we will anybody in there will have a voice. If something was to happen, if any type of racism or any type of discrimination was to happen, mm. we have a voice. And that that is to be through me and and my own um through me and my own channels and and, and me being in public eye. So be it, but I want people to be able to feel like they can speak because I felt like I couldn't and I knew how hard that was and I kicked myself for for nine years for not speaking out when I should have done. Um, And I just commend you for for what you're doing and and that's why I wanted to ask you that that last question which was uh, about your academy and what it meant to you because I just wanted to know if we had a similar feeling Uh. as to why 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 we've both done it and it's... It's just crazy how our journeys are so similar, even though it's different. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And just see the joy of them, the young kids, just you know, training and and doing well. And you know, I would notice if I'd not been there, and like Jenny would say, you know, they're a little bit slow today because you wasn't there. And when I turn up, you see this glow. They're like they got to really prove a point that. I'm training really hard and, you know, I could just sit in the background and just watch them and they, I could see them just looking and like, well, we've got to prove a point that, you know, Dave's here tonight. So it must be, you know, it must be something special, but now I'm down there all the time. They're getting a bit comfortable with me again. So I, I, I might have to like lay back for a couple of weeks and then go back down there. But, you know, I've just, I've just really enjoyed, I've, I've, I've embraced them more now because I feel like my, my mental state is better. And I, to be honest, when, when I was younger, because I couldn't deal with disabilities, I couldn't deal with anyone else with a disability either. You know, even, I know it's strange, but even when I used to go clubbing, when I was a youngster, like Camden Palais and all that, and if I saw someone else in a wheelchair, I, I didn't really want to talk to them. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I, and, and I look back at that and I was like, I'd never do that now. I, you know, if someone spoke to me in a club and they were in a chair, I'd embrace it. I would, you know, I'd talk to them. But I just didn't want to be associated with someone in a wheelchair. It was so weird. Like, I don't know. I, I didn't see myself as disabled. I've, I still don't really see myself disabled, but I think I've just embraced disability more as I've got older. And, um, and I'm just embracing the young lads now and the, and the young girls at the academy because... I just want to see them do well, not just in the sport, but just just in life as well. Mm-hmm. Well, well, if there's anything for me to take from this this conversation, it's definitely that to move forward, you have to accept and embrace things, and that's definitely something that you've done. And I, I just want to thank you again for for your time to sit down and speak with you. Um, I'm in awe of this conversation. I think uh, what you're doing is fantastic, and what you've achieved is fantastic. And I just want to thank you for your time. Oh, thank you, mate. I really appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and been easy, to be honest. It's um, it's not hard to talk about things, but, you know, I think when someone else has struggled like like I have, they, it's easier to talk to people like that. And, 
you know, like you keep saying, that we can relate to, to everything. And um, no, I'm just thankful for, for having this phone call. Cheers. Thank you very much. No worries, mate.